I might say you were in a state of stress <laughs> and I was in a state of tension which gives a good foundation for the discussion of the morning. We are much interested in these days in trying to do something to change the ways that are destroying our way of life. Every day the papers have reports of new and useful reforms, most of which do not work. They do not work because if they would work, we'd be using them already if we liked them. But they interfere with us. They make us do things we ought to do, and that is a very serious mistake. <laughs> no political party will ever succeed without us a slogan. So we take the problems of today and we say, what is the cause of stress? Well, stress is a misuse of something. When we use energy correctly, we have proper function. When we mix up things or make a serious mistake, we get stress. Stress may be the right thing in the wrong place, or it may be the wrong thing in the right place, but it's not where it belongs at that moment, and it is not doing the job it is supposed to do. And wherever stress appears, it's a symptom. It's a symptom that means correction is indicated. Stress gives us warning. Stress in the body can produce pain, which gives us warning. But wherever there is discomfort in this universe, we must finally decide that man is responsible for it. Nature did not cause the discomfort. Living things in various orders, becoming in one way or another maladjusted, this results in pain, stress, and uh, the misfortunes we worry about. Now today we are in the worst problem of stress, I suppose, in the history of the world. Now what is it? Is it a rate of vibration? What is this thing that is contagious and infectious and runs through nation after nation and brings the whole conglomerate into trouble? It is vibration, there's no question about that. Vibrations of one kind or another striking other vibrations which are not suitable or compatible, become involved in conflicts of one kind or another. The reason we are in the mess we are in is because we are out of step with the plan. We are not doing what we are supposed to do. We are not taking care of ourselves as we are supposed to. We are misusing the natural resources that come to us as we are not supposed to. And in one way or another, we are, in a sense, delinquents. Delinquent as a group, a delinquent civilization, a delinquent order of life. What we call humanity is re at the moment is really a delinquent order of life, something that seems to insist on doing things wrong. Now we can say that that's an exaggeration, that a lot of people are doing things right. But when we look into it carefully, we find that the people are doing it, who are doing it right are not very well known and not very numerous. But the people who are doing it are wrong are very famous and are very, very numerous. <laughs> and they keep on being numerous and they make new rules and new laws and new covenants so that they can continue to be delinquent. Now, it would seem that the average person coming into a country which he is not native to would do what we do when we visit foreign countries here. The first thing we try to do is to find a little textbook so that we can ask and answer simple questions. Then we try to study about the country a little bit, what its customs are. We don't want to insult or injure somebody. We do not want to appear to be unpleasant. So we do all ways that we can to do little things that make us pleasant in that country. And we probably get along pretty well, and of course, fairly, honestly, we are all the time looking for bargains. Bargains were really probably what took us there in the first place. It wasn't love of scenery. Well, we caught a little scenery along with the bargains, and all went well. Now, when we come into this world by birth, 
we are coming into a strange realm. Perhaps we've been here many times before, but we've forgotten it. There is nothing that we learned long ago that is immediately available to us. We have to search memory and re recapitulate some of the happenings in order to make ourselves adjustable to the new situations. So we come in new and ready, and we immediately begin not by becoming strangers and by trying to learn the ways of this country, which is going to be our host for a while, we come in with only one thought in our minds, to change the country. The country must do what we expect it to do. It must do just what we want. It must give special priority to everything that we like. And most of all, it would be honest when dealing with us, not necessarily all the rest of the time. So we come in here uh, to take over something that we know nothing about. And we've been doing that from the dawn of time. We have come in as my mental giants. We have come in as capable of ruling everything. And we have settled down to imposing our own laws upon a world that has laws of its own. Natural law is inevitable. Human law is usually in trouble. We go back to the very beginning of all this and we find various codes of law. Uh, like the codes of Hammurabi and the, loads of, uh, the codes of Justinian. We find that in ancient times men created codes. Now the earliest of these codes was probably the most honorable. We would consider them the most primitive. We don't think of those codes anymore because they demanded honesty and that was a mistake. We don't do that when we're really building something for ourselves. Mistakes are for other people and we want to profit from them. But we do not want to change our own ways. But in any event, we have these ancient codes. And they tell us very simply, keep the rules and they'll keep you. Break the rules and the rules will break you. But we're not following that line of thought. We are doing everything we can think of to create systems for evading facts. Finding that the truth is too uncomfortable to endure, we've got to change the truth, not ourselves. We must continue to find ways to doing what we will and want to do in a universe that says we have to do and be what it wants us to do and be. We are not here to change the universe. We are here to grow up. The child that goes to school is not here to build a new schoolhouse. He's there to take the instruction that has come to him. Now in the days that have gone by, we had plenty of opportunity going back 5,000 or 10,000 years to find out what happens when we're foolish. We've all watched and read about civilizations and cultures and individuals and families that did it wrong. We know the trouble they got into. We know the tragedies that they caused. And we also know that we have inherited a great deal of misery from their mistakes. But it never occurs us to us to realize that there were rules to start with that we should have been giving thought to, that we should really have been attempting to understand and apply. So we keep on making our own little rules and we keep on getting in trouble with them. But if we wanted to make the major rules, the changes that would straighten it out, it would cause us to do things that we really don't want to do. We do not want to cooperate. We want to compete. We do not want to rejoice in the well-being of others. That We want them to participate in the process of taking care of our well-being. All the way along, each individual considers himself the object of, the, of major consideration. He wants to do it his way. He thinks the world should permit him to do it his way. He thinks if he wants to take over somebody's country, he can do it if his physical strength is great enough to permit it. Where moral and integrity come in, there's no interest. So we have managed in the course of the last 5,000 years to get ourselves into a very difficult situation. We are in a condition in which we have catered to ourselves for so long that the possibility of not catering to ourselves is cataclysmic. It's going to be the most difficult thing in the world.
But as it stands today, we are in the midst of the mistakes we have made, and the effect upon us is called stress. Now, how are we going to understand this in some way of ameliorating the situation? How are we going to get the stress out of our systems? Well, we have all kinds of ways. Our physician can give us some good remedies, guaranteed, uh, to take the stress away for five years and take our life away for the rest of time. <laughs> we are going to sacrifice a little. We may give up, pay up our favorite brand of cigarettes, and that's a big sacrifice. That really is something. We're really afraid when we do that. And we find other things, cut down a little on the bourbon, do all these di kind of things, be a little bit uncomfortable. And if we get just so that we don't like what we're doing, maybe we'll be able to survive. Because survival seems to depend upon following rules we don't want to obey. So we keep on exploring the matter a little further. We can go back in history. There's plenty of histories available. We can go back now in art and music and literature, history, philosophy, anthropology, science, and find out all kinds of things about what human beings are doing and have done. And we can also find and learn from this that those who have kept the rules have done the best, but they very often have never been able to be heard to tell the story because they have been eliminated for interfering with the destinies of people who don't want to keep rules. So most of the great rule keepers of time have been martyrs, destroyed by the foolish, to, perf to perpetuate the folly of people who did not want to think. So we have stress building up, and in the 20th century, we have gone to the highest point of stress ever known. Uh, stress plus ingenuity, and, uh, individual initiative, scientific knowledge, all types of research and so forth, all these things added together not only bring us uh, advancements in knowledge, but they bring us tremendous compoundings of stress. Here we are. We, can, we know what we can do. We know what the atomic bomb can do. We strongly suspect what, what nation, nation is going to get it next. We are very certain that it is going to be loosened by somebody. And so we keep on going quietly along, preparing as much as we can for the worst, but never for a moment trying to change the worst. There's no, if the nations of the world would get together, say no more bombs, there'd be no more bombs. But if that happened, then ambitious tyrants, little dictators, and, uh, and uh, munition manufacturers would be very unhappy. Well, they must not be allowed to suffer like that. <laughs> we must uh, do what they want to and let God take care of them, which he will do. In the end, all of these munition manufacturers are going to be destroyed by their own inventions. But that is the way it goes and stress builds up. And here we are today with stress in every field of life. All of this stress because every field of life that we know of has become infected with the primary mistakes which have descended from time immemorial, both of the now and the past, and proverbially probably also the future, are interested primarily in wealth, fame, and uh, economy of building up great mercantile organizations. In other words, wealth is... Uh, Wealth is a science of industry. Wealth is an accumulation of the spoils of war. Wealth as uh, the result of stealing one person's land and giving it to somebody else. All of these things add together to wealth or fame, and these are success. And success is something that if it costs 10,000 lives on the right hand and 10,000 lives on the left hand, if one man is successful through all this, it makes it all worthwhile. The dead will never complain. So we have this. And the stress is beginning to worry us. Now some stress is dangerous. All of it is more or less dangerous, but some is really dangerous. And some is sort of primarily dangerous and largely ridiculous. The, the stress that we have in the arts and in education 
and in music and in these areas of the so-called cultural activities are really more or less ridiculous because we, there's not any case in which the new forms are equal to the old ones. We go now to the theater and we watch something that is miserably performed by people who know very little about theater or care less and receive enormous salaries for doing it badly. This is unpleasant. But we can all stay home. We can stay home and listen to the television and that's still more unpleasant. <laughs> so we don't have much choice unless we want to pay fifty dollars per seat to go and watch a ball game. It's all very foolish. And all together it's making people tired. It's making them sick. Now we know from nutrition and from the new sciences of diabetics and so forth that the individual who is emotionally distraught, who is psychologically disturbed, and who is physically underprivileged and undernourished is not going to be healthy. And out of the lack of health comes a series of things that are not just simply toxic in the sense of digestion. Out of this sickness-like condition of the majority of our people of the world is coming a, a sickness of life, a sickness of mind, a loss of values, a destruction of morale, and gradually they are destroying ourselves by destroying the integrities which make our survival possible. We are destroying the human race because we are neglecting the things that make the human race live. The human race does not live by the grace of God, except, not essentially. It lives by the intelligent, common sense, and integration of people. That we live because we keep the rules of living. When we break those rules, we threaten our own survival. And no one seems to care much about this. We hear a lot of objections, but we kind of feel underneath that it'll all take care of itself. We may not have any more trees, but that's a minor disorder. We don't realize that those trees are really very important. They simply basic nothing now but newspaper print on with the roots still on. We do not understand that when we change all these things, neglect the right things, and do the wrong things, that we become sick. We are sick of worrying, because worry causes desperate action. And desperate action can lead a peaceful people into war and massacre. We are also miserable because wrong actions upsets our economic balance. We do not know the security of our families, we do not know how much we're going to pay for rent next year. All these things are basic mistakes due to the fact that we have suffered from stress and suffer from it every day, but quietly decide not to do anything about it. Now, sometimes we probably will do something about it. And we remember the case in the work of, of the philosophers and the work of Serrano de Boccalini, where the wise men, receiving a great plea from, the, from humanity addressed to the gods, the gods pick out the wisest people in heaven and send them down to take care of the earth. So they all appear in some place, a modern equivalent of Athens, where they going, are going to do great things for the benefit of mankind. And everything they try to do, someone objects to. One, man, one of the wise men said, let us put windows in the hearts of human beings so that we can see the real motives of each other. Of course, it's symbolical. But uh, some other human being got up and said, if, if you do that, we can't deceive each other. And if we can't deceive each other, then business can't progress. And if we don't make mistakes, then others will. And if we make mistakes, they will also. But if we put windows in to everybody see everybody's mistakes, no one will believe in anything. Well, that's exactly the state they were in. So they tried one thing or another to see if they could find out what to do. And one day, success came by. Oh, it was magnificent. It had a great float as in a parade, accompanied by all kinds of dancers and musicians. And in the float sat success, a magnificent figure, jeweled and crowned, were carrying scepters and surrounded by attendants of magnificent proportion. And one of the wise men just 
by chance. Notice this little place where there was a gap in the, in the robes of success. So while the pageantry was going by, he lifted up a little bit on the robe. And what was under it? The bones of a skeleton. The, the success was a skeleton dressed up. And he told the rest of them about it. And said, oh, that's pretty serious. You can't do much with a world that conceals evil and tries to make it appear to be right rather than to change. So they said, we've got to do something. So they all got together and uh, tried to teach the people something. No luck. So at last they made a special official announcement that the whole thing would be solved by adding two cents to the price of cabbage. <laughs> the thunderous applause we received was received. Everyone said it's the most noble thought in all the world that now everything is solved. Everything is perfectly all right. We can all do as we want to if we can be just as nasty, unpleasant, and destructive as we care to be, and we'll pay two cents more for cabbage. And this uh, is such a good thought, and so wisely put, that the author was strangled to death in Venice as a re reward for telling the truth. So we find that the stress is present wherever folly controls conduct. And that is just about everywhere. Now we watch the newspapers a little in the last few days and there's some pretty nice things being said. There are a lot of people beginning to worry more about some of these problems. But the papers and the, the commentators and everyone else sort of hesitates for a moment and says, yes, that would be good, but how do we do it? How can we get this to work? Which one of the present principal legislators today should we approach to get support for this? Which one of our educators really wants to see education put on its right basis? How many believe in a dollar that's worth a hundred cents? All these things, they're all things that would help. But you try to find the person and they'll be very hard to find. Whereas you could bring up a whole mass of them shouting with joy for two cents added to the price of cabbage. It's the, this is the way it is being handled. So the average citizen that trying to live from day to day, not knowing how long his job is going to last, not knowing how long he can trust his doctor, how long he can prevent himself from being involved in some legal dispute, or vote for the wrong candidate, uh, how long things will endure as they are before they get so bad that the individual loses everything that he has, including himself. So this causes what is commonly known as stress. Stress is the realization that something is necessary and no one dares to do it. This is the type of thing in which the remedy has to come from a major cataclysm of some kind. And it looks now as though sometime between now and the middle of the 21st century, we're going to see a major change that is going to force this whole change upon us. Because nature in its infinite wisdom would rather finally weed out the tyrants and dispose of them then cause or allow the complete collapse of the entire system. Now we have this therefore as an environment. We have it giving us the problems of uh, uh, fumes from motor cars. It gives us the, uh, the problem of narcotics. All these different things. The major mistakes in industry and all the problems that face us today. How are we going to change all these things? How are we going to take care of agriculture? How are we going to get over poisoning the stock before we check, chop it up to eat? All these things have to be cared for. But something definite has to be done to force it. There has to be something bigger than a personal feeling. Someone more important than some legislator or some would-be humanitarian who has no influence, but perhaps a very good idea. So we must watch for the thing when it will come that will bring with it the forced change we have to have. Now when this forced change comes, those will probably cry the loudest who deserve it the most. Because if they had not, or someone had not deserved it very badly, we would never have needed it. But having broken all the minor rules of life, 
we are confronted with major rules that can break us. So we have people worrying. Worrying about the job. Worrying about the world. Worrying about religion. Worrying about whether the Muslims or the Hindus are going to govern something. Worrying about where they live. We're constantly working for some private cause. The uh, individual worrying the right, that the right to carry a pistol or a machine gun will be taken away from the private citizen. Why the private citizen should own 200 machine guns and rifles, rifles in this country is a question. The, the theory, of course, is that you might need them if there's a big revolution. Well, with a revolution like that and that armament ready, the revolution and the survival become very doubtful. Instead of solving the problem, we arm ourselves against it. And therefore, we are constantly in trouble. So here we are with our worry, our stress symbols, our young people not knowing what to do next, laws for everything you can think of, laws for every correction of moral defects that were never corrected before because no one knew how to correct them and no one knew what, they, what the universe really wanted. People didn't care. Most people did not build their morality upon universal law. They built it upon uh, religious congregationalism. They built it on what one church said for them, another church said for something else, one religion said it for Islam, another said it for Buddhism. Each one of these said it a little differently, but no one was really interested in discovering the simple fact that they were all talking about the same thing. Everyone was so frightened of the wording that they didn't stop for a moment to think about the ideas involved. So here we come along down through to the 20th century and we come now to the little planet that we live on. A little planet in which the air is getting more polluted every day but the water is no longer fit to drink. All these things are getting worse all the time. Congestion, land and problems, all kinds of employment situations, even religion and languages are becoming involved. Everything now is becoming more and more acute and the individual as a private citizen uh, did not know what to do. So while this stress is building out on, in space, tension is building up right here at home in the family. So the world's stress due to the world doing it badly is now coming through to family tension. The effect of this conglomerate of pressure on private citizens who have no background, no uh, essential uh, pre preparation for the responsibility of solving great social problems. There are problem solvers that are very simple. The truth, the truth of the matter is, most of our problems have been that we've made solution difficult. When it is not the solution, it's the problem that is difficult. But we haven't thought of it that way. So here we are with generations of young people growing up without integrities, without morals, with everything based upon the almighty dollar, and we get word coming through the mail any minute now of a new country that has developed a nuclear weaponry. All these things we take for granted, and then comes people. Now, people are a very interesting thing. We must study them carefully because we don't know how long we're going to have them. Uh, uh, we, ha we have to be uh, very careful of people because people are being hurt and disillusioned and destroyed every day. But people are the things that perhaps have the answers if we would give them a little credit. The average person has never been very rich and while he might like to be, I don't think he is ne necessarily willing to sacrifice everything for a few more dollars. The average individual has never had a high esteem for his position. He's done the work of the day. He's lived his life. He's retired on his pension and has departed in due time. Now these people are being affected very seriously by stress and it is coming in on them in every way you can imagine. And they are the ones who you would might say are the helpless victims of a system. They're not helpless victims because if they weren't partly guilty they wouldn't be in the trouble. Most of them could have done a little better. Movements like the populist movement and other political systems throughout the world could have done much more if the public had accepted them. 
but the public was really not quite willing to accept the idea that it's 100 cents on a dollar. It's not that honest, that strict. It really wanted other people to be honest, but it didn't want a code that made it honest as a group of people. So we had no correction. But at the same time, the stress and this strife and pressure and tension is building up. It is building up in every area of our society. It is building up at a rate unbelievable in terms of past history. We are having more difficulties and more relapses and more complete failures in the last hundred years than in the preceding two thousand years. Because now everything is exaggerated. Everything is built up. All thoughts are big, but there's nothing back of them. And these people who are suffering now from the mistakes of, the, of their ancestors and their own willingness to accept these mistakes are the ones that are going to have to do something about it in the next century. Well, there's a lot of things they can do about it. One of the things that can possibly, definitely do about it is to correct some of the major simple problems that face us every day. We've got to make sure that the food is fit to eat. We've got to make sure that the air is fit to breathe. We must be certain that some basic values that dip upon which survival depends are provided for. We can't keep on having oil spills all the rest of the hit of history. If we do, the history isn't going to be very long. We cannot neglect all these immediate things that are just actual monuments to stupidity and selfishness and can hope to go on. So all these basic, simple things will probably have to be corrected. We're going to have to find out what to do about the narcotics problem and do it. And we're going to find it difficult because we've raised two generations at least now of young people who have no sense of moral integrity and therefore are not afraid of narcotics, although they witness the complete collapse of integrity under the influence of them. So everything goes along, but it's all visible. We can see what is wrong. We see it every day. We see it in our thoughts. We see it in our newspapers. We, our politicians are talking about it. Our educators are trying to do something about it. And the rest of the citizenry is waiting, hopefully, that something will be done about it. But in the meantime, there come strikes, and another nation has the bomb. All of this keeps on, and nothing changes it. Well, nature is not that patient. Nature is very patient, and the laws of cause and effect work. And the principles of integrity work. We give every individual the right and the privilege of correcting his own faults. We give him the opportunity to do it right. If he's doing it wrong, we try to educate him. Nature tries to educate him. After 25 or 50 oil spills, nature has tried to educate us something about the petroleum industry. We have plenty of opportunity to learn. But wherever it is disagreeable or contrary to our economic choice, we don't learn. It is, uh, it is the thing that is done honorably that is considered as the objectionable uh, alternative. It's not the thing we should be doing. It's the thing that we should win without doing. Now, all this is also talking down into our personal lives. At the bottom of this chain of circumstances is the world home, the family, young people, all the things that go to make up the simple society which has been ours since the dawn of time. We are therefore in the midst of a time in which the most crucial values and factors lie in the immediate personal circumstances of people. We are in the presence of time in which moral problems are very serious. We are dealing with problems of abortion. We are dealing with all this type of thing. And we are dealing with all of it with a kind of nonchalance. Uh, it doesn't make much difference how it goes, business. And uh, if the justices, the Supreme Court, say it's all right, it's okay. But well, it's all that way. It doesn't make any difference who says it or what they say. It is either true or it's untrue. And if being true it results in misery, then the misery was necessary. If it, if it was not necessary, then the misery is sham. 
But we find every day that the problems that we create and face can only be solved by integrity. Now gradually, however, things get worse in the individual's life. Most people today in so-called civilized nations, which means really that they're not at war at the moment, this, uh, this type of thing is something they have to think about. They have to go into it a little bit and try and find out how to keep what is good and get rid of what is not good. Now, how are they going to see this? There has to be something that uh, forces this viewpoint upon us. Now, Nostradamus uh, tells us, or intimates very clearly, that in the 21st century, there is going to be a major upheaval. He's been pretty correct on everything he has done from reading the ancient books of the tribe of Joshua in the old Hebrew distribution. He is of the opinion that there, there will be a great con con confrontation that will probably begin before the end of the present century. In the next ten years, we are able to see more happen than in the previous hundred years, even though we went through two world wars and two depressions. In the next ten years, many things are going to be forced upon us in the form of change. We are confronting political situations like the uh, establishment of the sovereignty of Hong Kong. We are dealing with economic changes as in the relationships between uh, communist and uh, democratic countries. All around there is anything happening. Nation after nation is going to war. Leader after leader is leaving the country with the funds. All these things are part of a tremendous program that is adding up to something. Little by little, we are euchring the situation until a certain pattern is set up. A pattern which can result in a complete overwhelming and overturning of what we call civilization. Well, if we come to deserve it, we have to take it. And it looks very much as though we do deserve it. The only thing that we do not deserve is peace. We've never earned it. We do not deserve security. We have never honored it. So we will get what we have earned, but in the so doing, there's going to be a lot of headaches. And these lots of headaches are going to come under the form of stress and tension. The stress of the world will bring a result in the tension that descends upon people. Everyone today is tired. Everyone today is uncertain as to what to do. We are uncertain where to put a dollar for security. We are uncertain where to educate our children and what to teach them. We are ins insecure as to what we believe is religion and what we do not believe is religion. We are insecure in government, in education, in science. We are insecure in medicine, all these things. We are not sure of any of them. Not sure because we've never earned certainty. We've never tried to be certain. All of these things have gradually developed into tremendous rackets, situations existing only for financial gain to somebody and financial loss to somebody else. Now, it would be kind of nice if in these emergencies something could be done to arbitrate these major decisions so that instead of having to pass through another great catastrophe in which, as Nostradamus seemed to imply, that we would face Asia for the final showdown. But in any event, the uh, fact that these things could be arbitrated, there's no reason why there should be a third world war. There's no reason why there was a second one or a first one. All these tremendous pressures and circumstances were based upon the concept that people had that you could win a war, which you can't do. So always as the war is lost, and then actually hundreds of pages of history can be produced at any moment to prove that every conqueror and every despot has come to a bad end. But nobody pays any attention. Each one has the discovery or the invention that is going to make that his particular purpose successful. And in the meantime, new generations are growing up. Generations that are being born in periods of instability. The young person of today, growing up in the early teens, 
has absolutely no basis for building a mature judgment on any subject. Has no way of realizing that there are responsibilities in life that must be accepted. There is no thriving drive into religion to find the truths of faith. There is no particular interest in a moderate, simple way of life. There's no desire to go back to the farm, and if he did go back to the farm, it's probably subdivided into condominiums. <laughs> Always there's something. The land is now just being destroyed. The trees are being cut down. The rivers are being polluted. The sewage is so bad that even sewage can't stand itself. <laughs> All these things, and nobody does anything about them. Everyone is helpless. We don't have time, money, or thought to do something about the sewerage because it's much more interesting to see if we can land a projectile on Mars. Uh, maybe the man in the projectile hopes he'll get there, but then nothing is being done. Science is doing all these wonderful things. Men are born, men suffer, and men die. The, the great facts of life have not been considered. So it's either going to have to be considered or the stress will go on. And we may say that tension and stress are natural symbols for what is wrong. They are the evidence and proof and actual reality of needing the changes that we hope will be accomplished. And everyone who is interested will have to start accomplishing these things in his own family. I heard a case not more than two or three days ago of a very nice family of people who have a wayward child. And this wayward child is driving them all to destruction. It would be absolutely a, a miserable miscarriage of universal justice if the child ever belongs to anything. But the child will succeed, probably become very wealthy, will also have children who will succeed by very wealthy, and then some great flight of planes over the continent will destroy the bank and the stock exchange and leave nothing but death. So we have all these problems as part of stress. And this stress is being felt now, it's rather ridiculous to say so, that how with all this hanging over, with planes hovering, hovering in the air, sewage rotting in the bodies <laughs> of the grounds, with everything tied up and everything running down, that we should be very worried over such tremendous problems as where to hold the next Olympic Games. Uh, but these are the things that happen. We do not pay attention to them. We suffer when we could be curing things rather than wasting time. Now, it, most people are fairly busy. But at the same time, most people are wasting more time today than ever before in history. And wasting of time is a misdemeanor. It is something that's going to be held against us. Wasting of time is not fair. To sit in front of some television uh, outlet and watch people do things that are ridiculous, watch them also do things that are immoral and destructive, or wander around in a world of fashions and they call economics, and live this as life, to realize what has been said that many, many people spend some six to eight hours a day every day of their lives in front of a television. And yet on the television itself, they're never going to be the answer because they're going to be very careful to keep that off the air. We're going to get all, only the same things we've been getting. And people have no time left to do any thinking. They, if they read, they read things that are not very important. I saw not long ago a list of bestsellers in literature. The very best. They're doing very well. There wasn't one on the list that could contribute anything to the problems that we face today. These things are completely forgotten or ignored because they're painful. They get more and more painful. And then people are going to have all kinds of ideas. They're going to say, I had a nice boy. He grew up and he became a, de a dope addict. I just can't understand why he would do that. Why he did, we were a nice people. We were a good family. In fact, I think we went to church occasionally. <laughs> but uh, the boy just got out with the wrong people, as all of us do it. And now he is in, in an institution and will probably die. Why do these awful things happen to me? 
Why? Because we don't do anything to prevent them from happening. When the time came to give that boy the proper education, the proper insights, if either the family didn't know what they were doing either, or they were too busy to pay any attention to what he was doing. So it all goes. Millions of young people. We have about 200,000 a year of really serious juvenile criminals. This is not necessary, not reasonable. And it results also in a terrible headache for the facilities that exist to help these causes. There is no way that we can prevent the problem that we have, this problem of stress and tension, until we realize that we are nervous wrecks because of the consequences of our own actions. We have created a word that will drive, world that will drive anyone into a moral breakdown. But we don't combine or think of the fact that we are doing certain things ourselves has anything to do with the collapse of our culture. We, our culture, we think, is something separate. We pay a government five times what it's worth in order to take care of this for it. And it's taking care of nothing but itself. All of these things are mistakes that we either have to pay for or live with. So we have tension. We have stomach trouble. We have all kinds of things. It's very difficult to imagine why the ballot should have something to do uh, with ulcers of the stomach or why we would say that an election as it comes along can be held responsible for glandular difficulties in the human system. But the human body is a government. The human system is an organization. It is just as completely scientifically consistent as any other form in nature. And when the human body goes out of kilter, it's because something in the environment is preventing it from functioning. The conditions necessary for a healthy body are the same ones that are necessary for a healthy world. We don't have a healthy body and we don't have a healthy world. We have people who have worked very hard at some rather prosaic task into their 60s, then they retire. By the time they retire, their bad habits have begun to catch up with them and their older years are very often unpleasant. There is no need for these things but we do not do anything to prevent them. Now, we have probably 50 or 75 ailments that are particularly strong in the case of older people today or develop suddenly and unexpectedly in those of middle life. We suddenly find that people are cut down for no reason that we can see. They haven't done anything wrong. Maybe they spent a couple of nights a week in the bar or something, but they didn't ever did anything really wrong. Only five packs of cigarettes a day which everybody does, and they all look innocent. Yet these very same people know perfectly well what they are doing, but they're not admitting it to themselves and they're not admitting it to anybody else. So they're going into stress, stress, stress and tension. The tension that is inevitable when you know that what you're doing is wrong. And the, inevitable, the, and the stress is inevitable when you keep on doing it and will not correct it. So we have probably half the population of the earth today that knows it's not doing it right. But it'd rather worry itself to death than change its ways. And that's what it's doing. And we're finding new and interesting ways to keep more trouble. And then again again, young people will go out and die for principles that they never learned to live because they were prevented. Education should begin always with what is a clean, basic pattern for living. Education should provide each human being with a code of life that it can follow without fear, that it can go on and know that it can live its life within that code without unnecessary suffering which it causes it for itself. There's no reason why people should reach 50 or 60 years old before the fact that they've made a mistake catches up with them. Most of them don't even know it because they've been talked out of the integrities. The man that talked them out of it is also gone because he believed it. When tension is here, elderly people don't want to live alone. Retirement homes, homes that break up before, really before the baby arrives, families in which they're all one parent families, some not related or not married at all, 
individuals living by any system that they can think of or that appears to be most convenient regardless of whether it is correct or not. Well, between now and the end of the next century, this condition has to change. And it will change. The stars in their courses have so stated. There cannot be a continuation of destruction without a destruction effectively destroying that which it attacks. It has to be changed. We have to have a new way of living. We have to new have concepts of, of how to build a future so that we don't have to work on this stress-tension pattern. Nations should not have stress. If they didn't have stress, they wouldn't need armament because armament is fear of a stronger enemy. And no matter how strong the individual is, there's always a danger that somebody else will get an extra gun. Do we know that at the present time, nations are already uh, plotting how they're going to destroy each other. And this for human beings who have come up through mere thousands and millions of years of evolution to spend their own lives thinking about destroying each other is really pretty poor stuff. Something that nobody has a right to be very proud of. What we merely really need is simply honest thinking. Thinking that can be done by a ten-year-old child. Thinking it can be done in the backyard with a pet hen or a pet rabbit. Things that are so obvious and so real and so inevitable that there's no question about them. And because they are not questionable, no one asks about them. Because they probably realize that they get the straight answer. But if they did, that straight answer would, dis would dis disillusion somebody about something that they're doing every day. So, we got sick people. We got people with hospital bills that are much too big. We have a world that has all kinds of knowledge and everything of that kind. And still, we have difficulty in break it, breaking the minimum age limit. We may have put on uh, five years in the course of history to our, legal, to our lawful expectancies, but we have taken ten years off by our own dissipation. Everything has got to change. Now, we don't need a theology that is full of thou shalt nots, and we don't need all that uh, abracadabra that goes with it. What we know is we need to do is to re relate the fact that a natural universe, a universe of stars and st galaxies, this tremendous space manifestation that we know is not something that was created out of nothing. The tremendous pattern of things that we can see reveals to the ultimate knowable or discernible limit absolute law, absolute integrity, and absolute manifestation. Whatever it is, it's lawful, it's reasonable, and it's right. It always has been. Nothing has ever won against it. Nothing has ever lost that was for it. Now we have this there. The idea of trying to change it, trying to prove, for instance, that the ch young child doesn't need a home, dealing that it, trying to prove that it doesn't do better with one parent than he will with two. All of this is contrary. If it hadn't been, it wouldn't have been set up correctly. When the two-parent system was set up by natural law in the human family, it was set up because that was what the humanity was expected to have. We have been now several thousand years trying to get rid of this. Instead of trying to get rid of the integrities of life, we should be trying to get them built up, strengthen them, and give more power to that which it is obviously the intention of the creating power. We need these things. We need obedience to universal law and not obedience to the whining of ignorant and even criminal people. We need to understand nature. And there's no reason why a high school graduate shouldn't already know enough to live a clean life, not only for the length of time he expects, but maybe for a couple of extra hundred years if he does it right. We do not need to have all this vast experiment to try to prove something that's no good if we prove it. And when if we kindly do prove it, then something comes along and disproves it almost immediately. We need to have a, a reasonable fear of being wrong. 
of natural fear, natural anxiety. But this natural anxiety should incline us inevitably to correct the thing they're afraid of so that we will no longer fear it. And we will discover that what we thought we feared was really a wonderful truth in disguise which we were reluctant to accept. When we understand these things and understand them right, we won't have any problems. They're, they're perfectly natural, perfectly reasonable. The archetype of the universe, the great trustful board of, of the heavens, is there. We know the infinite patterns of life. We see them traced in the rocks. We see them in the mountains and in the seas. We see life in every element. And wherever we see man, we see him destroying life. When man destroys enough life, he's going to destroy himself with it. There's no reason why everything that exists should be sacrificed to the whim of man who doesn't even know why he exists or have any real interest in finding out. All he's interested in is being secure and prosperous and important for the few years of his life. Then he will disappear and his moral problems will disappear with him but they'll stay with us until somebody solves them. So we can get down to freedom from stress and tension. We all get tired. That's expected. We all have our little problems and we're not going to cure right away. But if we can get a basic set of values, knowing that if we keep the rules, they'll keep us. If we break the rules, they'll break us. And begin by recognizing what constitutes the foundations of a good life. The acceptance of responsibility. The recognition of the rights of others to succeed. The rights of all living things, animate and inanimate, to have their, fulfill their fulfillment in this world of what we, which we are a part. That all things have a right to be considered. The flowers of the field are not there simply to be burned. The trees are not there simply to be chopped down. The animals are not there simply to be slaughtered. All these things have to be corrected and put in their proper relations. And when humanity becomes harmless, it will not be subject to harm. When it becomes aware of the values of life and the principles that it should understand and nourish and protect, it will have a peaceful existence. There is no reason why the human family should not be the brightest and noblest things on the planet at this particular time. And that all other forms of life should gather around it as children gather around the parents. That all the animals and birds and everything in the world would find its place in a world where everything is thoughtful of everything else. This is perfectly possible. We have every reason for it. Most dietitians and nutritionists can prove conclusively that's what we should do. We don't do it. Why? We would much rather pay $15 for a steak and see the animal slaughtered. All these things have to change. And when they do change, stress will change. There's not going to be all this fear and worry and anxiety. We're not going to worry about our stomachs or our delinquent children. We're not going to hope that perhaps we live out our full life and not be destroyed by a war that would just tear down everything that we have. We do not know the mysteries of earthquakes and storms, but in some way the ancients knew that they were sent because of need. One way of reminding the individual that he is not essential in his present condition is that he is removable. If he was right, he would not be removable. He would not be removed. But where he does nothing, does nothing but cause trouble, he is impartial of good or wrong. He is therefore capable of being expended. So there will be better, better times coming. But I've noticed in the papers and things recently, the last year or two particularly, more and more people are becoming aware of this. The time is now coming more and more when we're beginning to think and they're beginning to think of how to do this right. Get it right from the beginning. And of course, average persons can't do anything very big and colossal about all this. They're not supposed to. It's not, life is not going to be saved by a few colossal people. It is going to be saved from average persons are ruled by their hearts, live according to their dreams and hopes, are kind to each other, worship truth and good, and devote the unfoldment of their lives to mutual service and cooperation. When we have that type of thing, we'll have a good world. 
And we don't have to have a specialist tell us about it. It takes years and years and fifth, great big 50 textbooks at 500 pages each to tell us how to do it wrong. When to do it right, all we have to sit down and just either open the Bible to the ascension on the mount or simply quietly realize the need for the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. That if we live right, all these elaborate remedies are unnecessary. The proof being that the false remedies never have cured anything. And wherever the true remedies have been applied even temporarily, they have made great contributions to permanent progress. After the wars, world's wars of the present century, after the tremendous uh, <coughs> sorrow and tragedy of probably 50 wars at one time in some places, we should realize that we are coming to the time when all this is stupid. There is no need of good people going out and killing each other simply over the fact that some dictator wants the territory. So, goodness, kindness, these things start at home. If you say we are under stress or tension, try forgiving an enemy, try being kind to someone you have neglected, try doing a service to someone in need, and try bringing a little light of understanding and insight to your children and their children's children. Do the things that are right in a little way, and a heap of little things done right may become the mountain of salvation. We are definitely at a division of the way. We must either go of our own accord, joyously, to the better things of life, or else we must go suffering from the penalties of our own mistakes. And it is much better to go gloriously than forlornly. And the forlornness will not be due to nature or natural law, but to our own selfishness. We have a perfect right to hope, to have as good a life, good a world, good opportunities as we are willing to earn. And we can start earning already. Most people have earned a little already. Just build on the little you got started with and keep it going. And by the time this great emergency arises, you probably will be very comfortable, very well set, and doing what you should have done all the time anyway. That's about the best we can do about it at the moment. Thank you.